We'll get into our sermon this morning in Matthew chapter 6. We continue in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus begins here talking about money. And you recall some people in the, 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 that have taken scripture specifically to say that money is the root of all sorts of evil. Now, that's not quite accurate. The Bible does say some things about money and, and the root, being the root of all kinds of evil. But it says this in second, excuse me, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil and, and, and creates that situation. God is not opposed to money. So as we begin this lesson and we talk about what Jesus is talking about here in the Sermon on the Mount, I want to un you to understand from the beginning, God is not opposed to money. In fact, money is a part of our worship service in that God has required that we give financially as members of his body. It's one of the five elements, if, if you will, of worship, preaching and, and singing of songs and praying and giving of our means as well as partaking of the Lord's Supper. He's not opposed to money. He's opposed to the love of money and what we might compromise in order to obtain money. Well, maybe even how we view money he might be opposed to. So in Matthew 6 here, Jesus is going to compare the importance of money with the importance of your service as a Christian. And he's going to do that in three ways, and then the lesson will be yours. And the three ways by which he's going to do this, to compare money or the importance of money with your importance of service as a Christian, is in planning, perspective, and priorities. Planning, perspective, and and priorities. So let's start with each of those in turn and let's talk about planning. What comes first in your planning? Is it your financial status? Is it your money? Or is it your Christianity? When you go out and some of you are already retired, some of you are still working, some of you have not yet entered into a field maybe as a career, and, and in all of those cases, retirement has been a part or will be a part of that conversation. If you're already old enough and you've stopped working, then you collect a retirement. Maybe when you began in your life, you planned for your retirement. You did certain things to make sure that when you reached a certain age, you wouldn't have to work any longer. And you, you and your spouse could be taken care of. We plan for our retirement, and if, if you're working now, you might be working in a job that has a, a retirement plan that benefits you, and if you're going to be entering into a career, that's going to be one of the deciding factors, probably, on whether you take a job. What is the retirement plan? How long do I have to work before I can be taken care of and, and in my older age? We want to make sure that we don't work when we get older. Some of us have even taken that a little step further. We, we, might, we might invest money into, into different retirement plans, into an account like a deferred compensation account in which we put money into it now and, and it's tax deferred until later when we take it out. We want to make sure that all is taken care of when we get older so that we can retire. Now regardless of what place you're in in, in in the world today, whether you're not yet in a, in a job that has a retirement or maybe you're working now with a retirement or whether you're retired, let me ask you a question. What would happen if you lost all of that? Sadly, there's been people that have experienced that. They've worked a long period of time and invested into a retirement account and, and somebody has swindled that money and they've lost their retirement. If you're paying now into that, if you're already retired and, and you're collecting that retirement every month, how would that impact you? Would it be devastating? If you're now working and you, and you lose the money you've already invested into your retirement, how would you feel about that? Maybe it's stolen in a scheme, as I mentioned earlier. Sadly, people have committed suicide after such kind of acts have occurred where they've, they've lost their retirement. It's devastating to them. Why? Because their financial planning collapsed. They lost their financial treasure. And Jesus addresses in Matthew chapter 6 in these first few verses the importance of where your treasure is. He says in verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither wrath, moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now this is a question for you. You don't have to answer this for anybody else but for you. But the question is, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure today? If you were to evaluate what's most important to you, would it be your financial situation or would it be your responsibility as a Christian? Is it in the amount of things that you have? Now, many, many years ago, I, some of you that are older might say it wasn't that long ago, but for me it was a few years ago, there was a popular bumper sticker that you would see on all of these, especially these big trucks, and it said something like this, he who has the most toys at the end wins. Remember that? It was all based on what you could accumulate physically in this life. Sea dues and boats and trailers and motorcycles, all the things that you could get, and then you could show off what you have. Is that where your treasure is? Is it in physical things? Is it in the amount of things that you have? Is it in your career and the comfortableness of this life? knowing that when you retire, you'll have some kind of nest egg that you can rely on? Or is your treasure in the kingdom? Is it in the kingdom of God? Now, some might ask, what does Jesus mean by storing up treasures in heaven? Because he's certainly, he's contrasting storing up treasures on earth with storing up treasures in heaven. So he's saying, don't do this one, do this one. In fact, we'll get into the end of this in verse number 24 where he specifically says you cannot serve both. That you've got to pick one and serve it. What does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? Well, it means easily in our example putting our treasures into our spiritual retirement rather than maybe in our physical retirement. Now, Jesus is not condemning saving money or having a retirement plan. Please don't hear me say that that's what Jesus is condemning. What he is condemning is where your heart is and where your true treasures are located at. Building up or putting into your spiritual retirement. Perhaps also building up the church, Jesus' kingdom. More important than your physical retirement. In, comp in comparison to your career, again, this is for you for a self-evaluation. In, in comparison with your career, how much time have you spent building up the Lord's kingdom? One hour a week on Sunday? Maybe two hours a week if I come to both services? Three hours if I include the Bible class on Sunday? Four hours, maybe, if I include Wednesday night? Or do you have things that you do outside of just our worship and our classes in building up the kingdom of God? We sing a song called Send the Light. And in that song, there's a verse that says, Let us gather jewels for the crown above. The reference there is to gathering jewels for not an earthly crown, but a spiritual crown that we will one day wear. In the song, storing up or gathering jewels is, 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 or building up treasures in heaven is related to converting souls. So let's get real for a moment. How many souls have you personally converted? How many people have you personally led to Christ? When I was a teenager, I recall, and I heard this from the pulpit, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to condemn the preachers that said it, but I think it was the wrong message. We used to hear, just invite someone to church, as if that means you've evangelized them. But you recall, Jesus says, as he's about to ascend into heaven, he says, as you go about your life, go therefore and make disciples. He didn't say, go therefore and invite them to worship services. And please don't hear me say we shouldn't invite people to wor worship service. There's a benefit in that. But don't lose, size of the don't lose sight of the responsibility of gathering jewels in heaven by you individually converting people for Christ. 
Jesus says in our planning, the kingdom should come before our financial stability. Are you storing up treasures in heaven? Well, how do you do that? We talked just a moment ago about evangelizing, and if you don't understand that terminology, it's just about sharing the gospel with the lost, helping those to see the importance of becoming a Christian. That's something you can do in your daily walk. In fact, again, going back to to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, the terminology, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. The terminology literally in Greek can mean, or, or does mean, as you go, as you go, make disciples. As you go about your life, make disciples. As you go to your job, make disciples. As you go to the shopping center, make disciples. As you go on about living, make disciples. How else can we store up treasures in heaven? Well, how about, how about teaching a class? You know, if you've never taught a class before, you can talk to any teacher that's here this morning or anybody who has been a teacher, and they will share with you this message. You learn more than any student will ever learn in teaching a class. The efforts that you put into preparation answer more questions for you than they ever will for what the student gains out of that. You want to build up your faith? You want to be able to be stronger as a Christian? Invest some time in teaching. We can do other things such as visiting, helping those or being around those. It doesn't have to be just visiting the sick. It can be visiting our fellow brethren. It can be visiting those that are, that are, that are not Christians. Not in an entertainment way, obviously, but it, with, with having our spiritual mindset and helping to share the gospel with them. How about this one? Building up relationships with fellow Christians. You know, God used a term in scripture to, to identify fellow Christians. We use that term, brothers and sisters. That's a family term. It's not a term of the moose lodge. It's not a term of those in the glee club. It's supposed to describe the type of relationships that Christians ought to have with one another. A family relationship. You want to build up your treasures in heaven? How about building up some relationships with your fellow Christians? And of course, building yourself up spiritually. Spending time in God's word and helping to understand, helping yourself to understand the very treasures that are found in God's word. There was a book written once uh, uh, by, by uh, it was co-authored, and it had a list in there, and it was called this, it was about different things that you could find in the scripture. It was called Diamonds in the Rough. What a great, I don't know where they got the, the, uh, the title from, but what a great description that it, as you study God's word, the more and more you study, the more diamonds you're going to find in God's word. How does your spiritual planning compare to your financial planning? Jesus says in our planning, the prior, the, the, in our planning, what should come first is the kingdom of God, building up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. Jesus next compares the importance of money with the importance of your service as a Christian in the area of perspective. What comes first in your perspective? Well, look at the following verses. The ver we read 19 through 21. Look at 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. How do you view the world? Now, this verse probably is one of the popular verses to be pulled out of its context and talked about when it comes to viewing things. And it's certainly true that how we view all kinds of things is important. But I want you to understand that Jesus is talking specifically about money. Some look at this verse and they think Jesus is no longer talking about money. But let me show you in verses 19 through 21, he's talking about money. And the verse that follows these two verses and on to verse 34 is talking about money. What do you think verses 22 and 23 are talking about? Money. Your view of money. 
Our perspective on how we view money and how we view the kingdom matters. What comes first in your life? If we were to ask that question in reference to your giving, what comes first in your life? I can say to you uh, uh, in a way that, that, that I, I'm shameful for, the, for this to be true, but it's honest. There was a time when in my giving, God got what was left. He got the leftovers. I paid my bills. I paid my house payment. I, I paid my car payment. I paid my insurance bills. I, I paid my doctor fees. I went to the movies. I bought the things that I wanted to buy and what was left over, God got. Now, sadly, some of us don't even give God what's left over. But God ought to come first. It ought to be the case. In fact, if you go back to the Old Testament, which is a great example on the mindset that we ought to have, God got the first fruits. He got what was best first. He got the best of the flocks, the unblemished lamb. We ought to give God our best, not what's left over. What comes first in your life and your giving? Is it God or is it self? He uses this terminology in verses 21, excuse me, 22 and 23. He talks about the eye being the lamp of the body. Understand that what he's saying here is the eye is the filter of the heart. The eye, our eyes are our filter, our perspective is, is how we're going to act. How we perceive things is, is laid out in how we do things. If our perspective is wrong, then our actions are often wrong. Why is it that there are people that feel perfectly comfortable with taking a person's life for a few dollars? You've all read the stories of, of walking into a 7-Eleven or some convenience store and the clerk being shot and killed and, and, and the assailant, the, the robber, getting away with a small amount of money. What, what allows them to feel perfectly okay with that? perspective why is it that a person can swindle money from the from the vulnerable including examples of of swindling from our elderly why why is somebody comfortable with that perspective you see when our perspective is wrong our actions are wrong and jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body our perspective and how we view things is going to be determined on how we act. Do you view the kingdom, the church, as the most important, most valuable thing on earth? You see, if your perspective is wrong about the church, then your actions will be wrong. Do you view the church, the kingdom, as just an afterthought? Something I go to every first day of the week, I'm part of. Check that box, God, I did what you told me to do, I went to worship. If that's our perspective, perhaps we need a change of perspective. And a change of perspective would then resonate in our actions as we act differently. Lastly, Jesus compares the importance of money with the importance of your service of, as a Christian in the area of priorities. What comes first in your priorities? Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. What comes first in your life? Your service to God or your accumulation of wealth? Is your career more important than your work with God? Does your work take priority to your responsibility as a Christian? Now, many people don't consider their job to be a problem with their Christianity, but the question we should be asking in relation to Jesus' teaching here is this. What controls you? What controls you? What are your priorities? Does your job take priorities in this life? You know, I found this to be true oftentimes when we meet someone for the first time and, and we say, tell me about yourself. Oftentimes, the very first response we get is what that person does for a living, what their job is, what their career is. Who we are should not be based on what we do as a career. 
Rather, who we are should be based on what we do as Christians. That ought to be to the core who we are. Does, does, does your job or your career take priority over the kingdom of God? Now, there obviously will be times in your life where the, the job, something might come up and your job plays a role in you not making it to worship service. But, but I, I knew a man once who, who worked a job for 30 years and he worked every single Sunday for 30 years. And his excuse was, my job keeps me from going to worship. May I suggest maybe it's time to find a new job. What's more important? Where is your priorities? Who is your master? We call Jesus master, but sometimes the way we act, if we're the slave and Jesus is our master, sometimes the way we act is he's the slave and we're the master. We ask questions like this. Jesus, what can you do for me? You ever heard a slave go to the owner and say, hey, master, what can you do for me? You see, that's a master-slave relationship. The slave serves the master, not the other way around. Where is your priorities? You see, if God's not first in your life, then you're really not serving him. There's a key verse in this section. It fall, it's just a few verses uh, further down. It's found in verse 33. Maybe. I don't see it. I must have missed I must have misplaced it. You can turn down to your Bibles or go down to verse 33 of chapter 6. Listen to what Jesus says there. He says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He just talked about not worrying about the, day, the things of the day and where we're gonna, what we're going to eat and where we're going to live. All of those things he just talked about in reference to our financial situation and his response is to rather seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Seek first his kingdom, his church. Seek first his church in your planning. Seek first his church in your perspective. Seek first his church and your priorities. And seek first his righteousness. Not our righteousness. It's not about what I find to be righteous or not righteous. But what God finds to be righteous or not righteous. What's first in your life? Does your family come before God's kingdom? Does your money come before God's kingdom? Does your career come before God's kingdom? You recall Jesus had the conversation with the rich man and, and, the, and the rich young ruler, excuse me, and the rich young ruler came to Jesus, asked a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him to keep the commandments of God and, 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 and the young man, knowing he was lacking something, said, I've done all of that for my youth. What else am I need to do? What am I lacking? And Jesus says, take all you have and sell it and give to the poor. And that man was unable to do that. You see, there was something more important to him than righteousness. There was something more important to him that, that, than God, we're serving God and his kingdom. And, it, and that was his money. And Jesus, the text says, two of the gospels that give this account say, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then he goes into the conversation with his disciples saying it is difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven why is that difficult God Jesus is not saying you can't be rich he's saying it's difficult because oftentimes money takes the priority you cannot serve two masters you either serve God or you serve wealth Jesus says in our spiritual walk and in the kingdom the church should come first in our planning, in our perspective, and in our priorities. There's that verse. I had it in the wrong slide. Sorry. There you go. It should come first in our planning, in our perspective, and in our priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Build up those jewels that will go in your crown, your spiritual crown in heaven.
put your planning, your perspective, and your priorities, place God first over all others. And you'll find that, that not only will you be blessed by God, but you'll be a benefit to the lost as you go and strive to help others see the importance of becoming a Christian. Planning, perspective, priorities. God ought to be first. So as we offer the invitation this morning, there are those in the auditorium this morning that have not taken the steps to yet put God on or put Christ on in baptism. They haven't yet become a Christian. They're not serving God. They're serving something else. Whether it's money or other things, they're serving something else. Why wait? Today is the day which, which you can put the Lord on in baptism and begin your walk with him and serve his kingdom and his righteousness. Maybe you're already a Christian and it's time to rededicate your, your planning and your per perspective and priorities so that, they're, so that they're in the right mode. Maybe they got out of whack. We, we turn on the TV and we sometimes, on television, the news and the movies we see, we get, we get told all of these different things and, and maybe our perspectives and those things are out of whack. Today's the day you can rededicate your life to service of God. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, I encourage you to, to come now as together we stand and sing the song selected for the invitation.